Hello, welcome to my shop. Uh, GWA videos are normally done from recordings made during uh, club demonstrations in, Peach, in the classroom at Peachtree Woodworking. Uh, I did this demo for the club a couple of weeks ago. However, there was an issue with the recording, yeah, so I decided to redo the recording here in my home shop. Uh, this is an ornament that I've been making for several years. I call it the cross-drilled ornament. Uh, there's a YouTube video on it. Uh, it's a two-part video, one part on making the globe in one part on making the icicle and finial. Uh, Glenn Watts uh, saw my video and he sent me a message stating that he uh, makes these buttons like a campaign button uh, and, and instead of having a, a sparkly bit hanging inside he just puts the buttons on the outside of the hole and, uh, and makes an ornament that way. And he was wondering if there might be some interest in my area of people using his buttons to make ornaments like this. Uh, so I suggested he send me some buttons and I would uh, make an ornament up or two and, uh, and take them to club meetings for show and tell and, and see if there's anybody who was interested in using his buttons. Here's a sample of some of the buttons that Glenn sent me. Uh, you can have either uh, you know, stock Christmas images such as those or you can have personalized photos in them. Uh, the buttons come in two different sizes. The small button is uh, uh, 15 sixteenths in diameter and the large button is uh, 2 and 13 sixteenths in diameter. Uh, the this buttons with stock images, stock Christmas images, are a dollar a piece. Uh, the buttons with personalized photos are three dollars a piece. Here's Glenn's contact information. Uh, the web address is uh, www.badgesandmore.com. His email address is g3en at yahoo.com. Uh, his website has an order form. Uh, with information on ordering his buttons, and he, and he has you know, pictures of all the stock images that you can get from him. Uh, this is a sample of the uh, ornaments that I made using Glenn's small buttons uh, on the same uh, idea of my cross-drilled ornament, about the same size as that ornament. The name that I've given this ornament is a button-style globe Christmas ornament. This ornament with the small buttons is nice with the stock Christmas images. Uh, but I believe the small buttons are just a bit too small for photographs. Uh, hanging on the Christmas tree you would have to get up real close to be able to see what they were. I really wanted to use the larger buttons, uh, but to use a globe ornament like this I would have to have a globe about three and a quarter inches in diameter, which in my opinion is just way too large and it would be much heavier. I really wanted to use the large buttons but uh, not with a globe ornament so I told, spoke to Glenn about it and he suggested doing a, a, a disc style ornament. So here's my version of a disc style ornament using the larger buttons and I, now I have photographs on there so I got some photograph down here of, uh, of relatives, I got some pets over there and then the stock images. And what I do is I'll put a photograph on one side and just a stock Christmas image on the other side. I refer to this ornament as a button style disc ornament. And I, I put together a paper uh, showing the steps of, of how I make these ornaments. I make the paper for my own purposes just so a year from now when I want to make more ornaments I don't have to remember the details. I can just refer back to my paper. I'm willing to share it with anybody who would like to have a copy. And if you'd like to have a copy of, the, uh, of this paper uh, just send me an email to gwa-turner at hotmail.com uh, requesting the button style Christmas ornament paper and I'll be happy to share it with you. I'm going to start out with the disc ornament uh, due to the fact that many individuals have an aversion to making Christmas ornaments because of the icicle and finial. For the disc ornament I want to start out with a, uh, a three quarter inch piece of wood um, about just slightly over three inches uh, square. I've uh, marked the center and then drew, drew a uh, three inch uh, diameter circle uh, around the edge which will be cut off later. I'm going to uh, drill a, or bore a, uh, a recess or a mortise 
in here to accept the jaws of my chuck. Now I'm using the uh, the, the one-way talon um, chuck with the tower 50 millimeter tower jaws. Um, the the depth of my mortise or rebate is going to be deep enough to receive uh, to allow purchase on both of those rings on the uh, jaws of the chuck. So I need to drill my hole about uh, three sixteenths of an inch deep. Instead of bringing the drill down, the drill press down on the wood, I, I bring it up and, and and find the point on the on the bottom of the Forstner bit. And then I bring the the um, the quill down, hold it in place while I, while I install some clamps. I'm running the drill press at about 300 RPMs for this operation. Now I'm using the, the uh, notch on the chuck here for the depth. That first, that first notch, I want to go down to where that first notch is just not, we can no longer see that notch, which it looks like I've got a pretty good depth there now. Okay, I've used my scroll saw <coughs> to uh, knock off the corners. I could have done it on the lathe, but I, my feeling is with this shallow a tenon, it would be a lot of stress on the tenon to take those and to take the corners off. Um, and it, it's just as quick, in my opinion, to uh, cut them off with the, with the scroll saw. Uh, you could do it on the bandsaw also. Now we're going to use that recess to mount it on the chuck. And to accomplish that I'm going to use this bowl gouge. It's got swept back wings. It's a Glenn Lucas gouge uh, with his uh, G4 grind. And do that, we'll run the lathe at about, uh, about 1300 RPMs. And that's a pretty clean cut with a bowl gouge. Had, had there been any any grain tear out on there, I could, would have uh, come back and touched it up with the uh, spindle gouge. Uh, but that looks good. Next thing is I want to face this surface off here. It wasn't running quite true. So I'm going to, uh, in a scraping fashion, I'm just going to use, use the tip of the tool, the nose of the tool, to, uh, to come across in a scraping fashion, just to make, the, make that edge true. See if I still get a flat surface. Round it a little bit so I just need to get some more off the center. And that's pretty good. Okay. Need to bore that hole out. Maybe with the. Uh, I forgot to mention that on, on the uh, when I was over at the drill press, but the the button is. Uh, Two and three sixteenths inches in diameter. <coughs> I've not been able to find a two and three sixteenths inch uh, diameter Forstner bit, so I'm using a, uh, a a two and one eighth inch Forstner bit. I'm using a Jacobs chuck in the tailstock with my uh, two and an eighth inch Forstner bit, and I want to put the bit in so I can see that first notch. That notch right there is my. This notch right here is my depth gauge when I no longer see that tip of that notch. That tells me when I've got the hole deep enough. 
But before I do that, I want to make a, a mark the center. And for that, I'm going to use this little skew. Just going to mark that center point. I'm going to run the run the down to about 300 RPMs, but the reason I put that center point in there is I the chuck or the or the, uh, the tail stalk invariably has a bit of pre-play in it, and if I just jammed it into the uh, to the move, to the turning piece, it wouldn't necessarily be in the center. So with that with that center marked, I can bring the Forstner bit up exactly in that center spot. Again, running about 300 RPMs. Now I'm going to remove some more material out of the center to remove weight. Now if I need a, a ledge for the uh, for the button to sit against or a glue for a glue surface for the button, so I'm going to drop down to a uh, one and seven eighths inch Forstner bit and bore in about halfway. the disc. And then bore in from this side until I uh, meet the other hole. Okay, so this hole, the, the outer hole there needs to be enlarged uh, so that it'll, to, uh, to match the button, we got a one or, uh, two and an eighth inch and the, the button is a uh, sixteenth of an inch larger than that, so we need to enlarge that hole by a thirty-second of an inch. And to do that, I've got a, a little uh, uh, shop-made uh, square, square nose scraper uh, that the uh, nose is ground back at about, 40, or about 60 degrees. And then this left, the left edge here is, is, is relieved by about 85 degrees so that I, when I'm cutting on center, I don't uh, hit the bottom edge down there. It's relieved down there so it doesn't, uh, doesn't rub on that bottom edge. Okay, so for this I'm going to go up to about 1,000 RPMs. Just pretty close to being good as it is. I don't think, yeah, I'll take, I'll just take off just a slight amount. Just to chew that face up and just take it down just a little bit more. Back up to 13. Edge, straight. I mean, straight edge. Yeah, that's good. The, the button is just just sits proud of, slightly proud of the surface. Then we'll reverse it again and, and do the same thing on the other side to make it uh, large enough for the button. Next operation is to bore a, a three eighths inch hole for a dowel that will be a mounting point for that cap. When I first first started doing this, I used a wooden a screw clamp like this to hold it and then drill the hole in the drill press. 
but I wasn't satisfied with the, with the reliability and precision that I was getting for that. The hole would not always be in the center. So I came up with another plan. These are uh, Nova pin jaws uh, made for uh, drilling out pin blanks on the lathe. And what I do is I've, I've got uh, blocks of wood cut to, uh, to match the size of my, uh, my disc. I've marked a center line for, for lining up the, uh, the, the disc. And I've also marked lines here to match the points on the jaws. I need to mark my, uh, my piece. I don't want to go into the end grain because that would it'd be, it'd be weaker. The end grain on either side of the hole would make it weaker. So I want to go, want to go into the side grain. And where I look, I can look at the grain lines. And I can see the curvature, the curvature of those growth ring, lanes, rings like that. I just put a mark about in the center of that. That should be right in the center of the, uh, of the side grain. Mark a line across there for the where I want the hole to go. And I use the lines there to line up the blocks in the in the, the center of the blocks and the center of the chuck. And then I drop my block, my ring or disc down in there and line it up with the center line. Again, I need to mark the center with the skew. I'm going to run that about, again, about 300. This is a smaller bit. I could do it a little bit faster. I'll take it down to about 400 RPMs. And mark the center. Okay, now I'm using a, uh, a 3 8 inch Forsner bit. Uh, a a uh, regular twist drill would have a tendency to pull the fibers out and, and not make a nice clean hole. And I think even a brad point bit would not make, would not make as clean a hole as what the uh, Forsner bit makes. And I want to drill this hole about a quarter of an inch deep. If weight is a concern, you can uh, hollow out a little some material in there between the two ledges and, uh, and, and remove a bit of weight. Um, the disc as is is about 1.1 ounce and we'll go ahead and remove a bit out of the middle there and see how much we gain. And like I say, this really isn't, isn't necessary. With, even with that 1.1 ounce, the, uh, the two discs are about 0.7 ounces, so it'd still be less than 2 ounces, which is not too bad for the weight of a Christmas ornament. Okay, and to do the hollowing, I'm going to use this little shop made hollowing tool. Started out as a, it's not, it's not high speed steel, got it from Enco, it's a quarter inch square. Um, you know, heated it with a torch and, and bent the tip over and then uh, ground the profile on it. Got a homemade handle where I, the handle was in two pieces, and I, I uh, cut a uh, quarter inch wide, eighth inch deep uh, dado down both halves of the, of the, of the wood when it was still square. Put in a threaded insert, and then uh, you know, glued them together using the uh, the square tool to help line up the uh, the insides there. And then I just kept pulling it in and out and wiping the glue off to get the excess glue out of there. And then once that was done, then I turned it. 
So it's a nice little handy tool there that's very inexpensive to make. So we'll use this to just remove a bit of material out of the center there. We'll go up to about a thousand RPMs for that. I've went down to just where the, uh, I just penetrated the hole of the, of the tip of the Forstner bit. So about then we'll go any deeper in that to lose my uh, mounting point for the little tenon in there. Okay, let's see how much, see how much we gain by taking that material out of the center. I'll gain two tenths of an ounce. So I took it down to 0.9. Still be taking some more material off the corners here, so that'll make it a bit lighter still yet. And I want to mark the center line just as a reference, and I'm going to use the, that hole that, that the, uh, the t on the tip of the Forstner bit as, as a guideline for the center. I'm going to use the, uh, the bowl gouge again to round that off. Now when I'm cutting the, the uh, rounding this off, since the grain is running across the bed like a, like a face plate or a bowl turning. Um, I can't start out, out here and, and start rounding the bead that way because I'd be forcing the, the edge of the tool into the end grain and it could it'd give me a rough cut, but it could it, it could catch in the end grain. I, since I don't have so much material here, it could easily just split the piece apart. So I'm just like on a bowl, I've got to cut from the smaller diameter out to the larger diameter. So we can take this back up to about 1300. I'm just looking for a nice, nice flowing curve there. This is the shape that I have chosen to put on it. You can, uh, you can put whatever shape you want. Okay, the curvature feels pretty good. And then to clean that up, I'll use a little shear scraper. This is the Robert Sorby. Uh, can pack, it can package two different ways, well three ways actually, it can be packaged with as a chatter tool, the chatter tool fits in the slot here, um, and it's also packaged just as a uh, shear scraper with the cutter bit like that, and then you can get it packaged with both both flavors. Um, I, I made up a, a similar tool, I 
Here's a shop made tool that does the same thing. I've taken a piece of uh, half inch uh, steel from Ace Hardware, uh, ground a, f a sloping bevel on the front there, and drilled a hole in it for, to put a cutter in. So you could, have done, you could have done the same thing. I can't use this cutter on here because it's a smaller hole, but it's the same, what does the same purpose, where this one is about $70 and this one probably costs uh, less than $10. Still got, a, still got a little bit of a burr on there, so we'll try it see if it, if we don't need to sharpen it, we'll, we'll try and see. So I just want to go around in a shear scraping fashion and just, just take, I've got a little bit of a, a low spot right there. Got a little bit of low spot right there, so I'd go around in a shear scraping fashion and, and uh, clean that up. Okay, I want to put a little tech, a little a decorative finish on that, touch on that. So I'm going to make a little groove. I've got another shop made tool that's on the other end of my square nose scraper, and it's got a little bit of a point tool. So the the, the bottom edges is, is, is shapes are like the pat prow of a ship, and then the top edge is, is beveled down like a uh, negative rate scraper. And I'm just going to put just a little bit of a groove about oh. <coughs> uh, I think you can use a bit of sandpaper and uh, clean up the bottom of that groove a bit. Well, most people I've seen that, that does this sort of thing puts a, uh, a ring around you like that. We use some sort of a hardwood or a, 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 like ebony or coca, maybe not ebony, but coca bolo. Something that's, that's hot, oily wood that'll burn. You have to sharpen a point on it and get it in there in, 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 in that curved surface. It'd have to be a fairly short point. So instead of doing that, I'm just using a lead pencil. And I do the same stuff on the other side. So the next step is to uh, sand it. I would probably start sanding at about uh, you know, 150. Do a little bit of a crown right there, so I may need to start it at uh, 120 and sand it down to 400. Okay, I've went through and went through the grits and sanded it down to 400. And now I'm going to put a, the finish that I put on it is, uh, is CA. I'm using this Starbond, uh, the super fast thin glue. And to put it on to apply it, I first when I first started uh, experimenting with CA, I was using paper towel, and it just the, the cellulose or whatever in the paper towel just causes the glue to start setting before you want it to set. So I found this. It's just a foam sheets. It's I found it in the uh, the children's art section in Walmart. So I cut it into strips like that. And uh, running running the lathe the speed running the lathe as slow as it'll go. To get started out, I'll just put a I'll put a, a drop on the uh, on there and and then. Just start moving it around. Just put a little bit more on. Just make sure I dry spots. And the nice thing about this foam is it doesn't soak through the foam to get on your fingers. And you can't see the back side here, but I'm just doing the same thing on the back side as I did on the front. And just go around until I don't have any. Now you can see the glue, even though it says it's. Uh, you know, super fast. It still it stays liquid long enough that I can go back and rub rub it in and get good good coverage. And I do that. Uh, you'll let that dry for a while, and uh, and then come back and put another coat on it. You sometimes I only just put two coats on. If you just just look at what the what kind of buildup you're getting on it. Uh, but uh, I've done it as little as two coats and then buffed it on the Beal system and it gives it a nice, uh, nice glossy shine. Okay, the next step is to turn a uh, 3 8 inch dowel that will fit in this hole and be long enough to, to 
mount the gold, little gold cap on. I switched to a Nova G3 chuck for this operation and I believe these jaws are referred to as uh, small dovetail jaws. A dovetail on the outside but they got a sm smooth uh, bore on the inside for a, for a straight sided tenon which I've made it down about a 5 8 inch tenon to fit in there. Doing it between centers so I'm going to turn it down to uh, just a short section down to 3 8 inch uh, for that dowel. And I got the RPMs up about 1700. A little bit of a champ on the end to uh, put the, uh, the body in there. Okay, just need to mark the uh, the length of the dowel that where I need to cut it off at. I'm not going to bring the tailstock up real tight. The, the bearing is free, so I can part that off. And uh, down to about a sixteenth of an inch. I can finish it off with a little saw. Okay, I ended up putting uh, three coats of CA on here. And I, I had a little bit of some rings here in the center, so I went ahead and I just lightly touched it up with 320 and then uh, 400 and 600. And I'm going to buff it on the, the Beal uh, buffing system. We'll start off with the triple E wheel. Now since it's a very thin coat of CA, I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on this on the, 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 the triple E wheel, just a very light coat. We'll run the wheels up to about 1500 RPM. And again, just a very light coat, a very light pressure on the uh, the triple E. You can see this with a triple E.
quickly there's the results of just using the triple E wheel. Okay, the white diamond wheel is next. I need to put a little bit more pressure on the white diamond wheel. Okay, I have a second white diamond wheel, only with this wheel I charge it with a compound called Bonex. It's a, it's a compound specifically made for buffing plastics. Also get with the Vonex wheel. And then with the wax wheel, I can turn the speed down on the wax wheel down to about a little over a thousand. the results with the final with the, and there's the results we get with the wax wheel. Okay the next thing I do is to is to glue the uh, the uh, three eighths inch uh, dowel in the in the, the hole just as a, a alignment marker for when I put the buttons in I have a good reference point for the top side. So I'm just going to be using uh, tight bond original tight bond because that's what I've got. Squeeze a little bit out on the paper, and then we're going to use a, a, a little bamboo skewer just to get some glue and, and put around inside the hole. And that was a pretty snug fit, so just press it down and get it all the way in. There's a there's a button installed. The next step is to glue the buttons in. Uh, you need a glue that's going to be compatible with both wood and metal. And so, I, first my first choice was this gel super glue. Um, it had a, a very fine uh, tip on it for for an application, and it has these little little buttons on the side that you can press to get a nice consistent uh, uh, bead of glue out. The problem is it only hold has 0.14 ounces of glue so it only had enough glue for about four buttons. And I think it was about two dollars and fifty cents a, a, a bottle so I thought that was kind of expensive for gluing in four buttons. So my next 
go look for some other uh, gel super glue. This is what I had at Home Depot. It's the applicator tip on it is not quite as fine. It's a little bit, little bit more coarse, and it, the the application is not quite as as uh, as consistent. Okay, and I try to put. A, I don't know if you really need to put a bead all the way around it like this. Probably just a couple dots around there would be sufficient. Um, And like I say, use that, use the button as a guideline for the top, because once you put it in, you don't get a second chance. And then you reverse it over, reverse it then, and, uh, and glue the other button in on the other side. This is the miniature Christmas ornament that I use as the sparkly bit on my cross-drilled ornaments. Uh, however, I cannot use that, that hanger like that. I need, need a much smaller hanger, so you take, just pull it out like that. And this is the, uh, the source of where I get my that little gold cap. That, the gold cap that I use on the top of the ornament is the leftovers from the, uh, from the sparkly bit that comes... The gold cap comes off of the miniature ornament that's used in my uh, cross-drilled ornaments. Again, I want to glue this on with uh, with a glue that's compatible with wood and metal. So I'll use the same uh, I'll use the same gel CA glue for that. The glue should be dry here on my uh, on the cap. Now, just mark a little center hole there. And I've got a, a number drill bit to size to fit my screw eye. And just manually drill the hole in. And there we have the uh, finished disc ornament. My sphere ornament starts out between centers in normal spindle orientation with the grain running lengthwise of the bed of the lathe. So I, I, I turn between centers there's the, the drive center spurt uh, point, and there's the tail center uh, mark or indentation. I turn it, turn it that, and I, I just I get the as close as I can using a template of the curvature going this way, and then then I will I've got and I turn that to where I've got a 50 millimeter spear. My diameter measure around here is 50 millimeters, so then I turn it in. This orientation, which is going to be uh, in the uh, side grain orientation, and I do the same thing. Got, there's, there's the dry spur, marks left by the dry spur, and there's the mark left by the uh, tail stalk. And I turn that, and then I, I turn off the nubs that were left when I did it the, the, in the initial orientation, and get it as close as I can with the template right across that area there. And then I switch it to the face grain orientation which is the mark there and the mark there for the tailstock and and then you know get rid of the rest of the uh, the little lumps and bumps that way uh, a future video will explain in detail of how I go about making this sphere my icicle and finial always starts off with a quarter inch uh, tenon with a uh, 45 degree taper and to correspond with that, then the first thing I do on, on the sphere is I drill in, into the end grain. I'll drill a quarter inch hole in the end grain and then put a 45 degree taper around that hole to fit the icicle and finial. I will not be covering the icicle and finial in this video. I've had several other videos uh, that have went into that in detail. 
one being the cross-drilled ornament. There's two videos, one, one on the uh, making the globe and one on making the icicle and finial. So if you have questions about the icicle and finial, uh, please refer, refer to that video. Then after I get the, uh, the holes made for the icicle and finial, then I work on the side holes that are going to be uh, the, the holes for the buttons to fit into. And to hold that on the, on the lathe while I'm working on it, to, you know, to hold it in those positions, start out with a little um, uh, easy wood uh, face plate. Uh, attach the piece of Baltic birch plywood to it with some uh, uh, T-nuts. I drilled a hole in here, and and then I, I cut this tape. This, this is this about quarter inch deep here is, is meant to match the contour of my 50 millimeter sphere. And then I have a face plate that goes on to there. It has a corresponding tape here for a 50 millimeter sphere with a hole in the, in the center big enough to uh, look, provide clearance. And then this is just a straight uh, straight cut here that I use for a different uh, for a different uh, type of ornament not really needed for this ornament here. I find it easier to get it to uh, get this thing started. I'm going to put the ball in there like that with the end grain orientation showing and then I'm just going to uh, just loosely uh, screw my uh, cap cover plate down just enough to hold the, uh, the sphere in place. Still free to turn, but it's going to help. Put it up on the uh, on the spindle, and I bring the tailstock up to register that uh, that hole, that my my original turning point on the uh, on the end grain. And I just rotate it by hand. I want to, I want to get this face plate uh, running as true as possible so that I'm putting equal pressure, forcing the, uh, the, box, the sphere into the center of that hole. I don't want it to be cocked and trying to force it off to one side or the other. And I need firm enough pressure on there with, with my uh, quarter inch sort of uh, recess in there that's, that's contoured to fit the, uh, the ball. I can put a quite a bit of pressure on it without putting any mooring on the sphere. Whereas if it was just a, uh, a sharp corner, you know, when, you, when you tighten it down enough to keep the sphere from moving, you could very easily put dents into the sphere. Okay, that looks pretty good there. Okay, so we'll switch to a uh, little uh, quarter-inch uh, stubby uh, brad point bit. Okay, I'll spin the lathe at about 400 RPMs for this. And I want to drill halfway through. And again, I'll bring the tailstock up loose, then tighten it down, and then go ahead and bore in. I'm going to switch to a, uh, a cutter that will give me that, that 40, it's a 90 degree combined angle across the, the flutes here, but it'll give me the, the taper that I need for my, uh, my fitting on icicle. Now if, you, if you've seen the cross drilled ornament video, I said that I had trouble with my, ca my countersink going, wanting to go in straight, and I would start off making the, uh, the, the cut with a, with a spindle gouge. Well, with a flat surface on there, yeah, you can easily get the spindle gouge on the bevel and then bring it around to make the cut in there. But the sphere like this, it, you, you can't really get the bevel on it to really control it, and it's very easy to get a, a cut back. 
But with this cutter, I think it might be a uh, milling machine type of cutter. It's got three flutes on it. And it, it is giving me pretty reliable holes that go into the center. And, and, and don't move off. And I want to go down and, to, and, and have a, uh, a cone that has about a half inch diameter. I want a cone that's about, uh, going to be about a half inch diameter, half inch diameter across. That's pretty good. Okay, then I, I take it out, flip it in for end, and do the same operation from the other side. But we'll move ahead and do the uh, the, ne the next step. Then is to st to drill the uh, the holes in the sides. Again, the button being slightly over 15 sixteenths, uh, I've got a 15 sixteenth uh, Forstner bit which will be enlarged slightly with my uh, square nose scraper. Again, I'm going to use that, that notch there on the, uh, on the Forzner side of the Forzner bit as a depth gauge. Then to reduce some weight out of the center of the globe, I'm going to bore halfway through the ornament with the three quarter inch forcing bit. hollow using my, my little hollowing tool. I'm going to just, to just take some more material out uh, to reduce the weight a bit far, a bit more. And I'll, to do this I'll go up to about a thousand RPMs. down to where I've got about an eighth or a quarter of an inch of, um, of, of a wall surface left, still left here inside the uh, quarter inch hole for it to have a gluing surface for the uh, icicle and finial. And I didn't show all the hollowing process just because I couldn't, you know, couldn't get the camera situated to where you could see what was going on. Plus, you really can't see in, inside the, uh, the ornament anyway. Uh, but I got a pretty good relief in there uh, to remove weight. The next step then is to is rotate around and do the other three sides with the same process. And in the end, we got uh, we have the, the holes in for the icicle and finial and the, the holes with the ledge on which to, to glue the, uh, the buttons. Installing the buttons in the uh, globe type ornament is the same process. I always stick the finial in first so I have a reference point of which way is supposed to be up in my buttons. And then you repeat that process three more times. And with all four buttons glued in, the final process then is to install the icicle.